Wiki Educators, the OER Online Community. Uh, the reason I chose this as a project was because of my uh, relationships with uh, my interest in the free culture movement, the do yourself movement too, and uh, EduPunks, and uh, the applications of technology uh, and the capabilities for it to revolutionize education. Why Wiki Educators? One of the concerns that I, uh, I think uh, some uh, ICT scholars and uh, some individuals that are interested in uh, the future is uh, what are the um, implications of uh, social networks and the increased use of technology for education. And to that partly is related to uh, Moore's Law and the uh, increased rate of innovation and the uh, lowering cost of technology and how today we are linked not just locally to uh, social, small social networks that people at church or at school, but rather we are joined globally and that has led to a drive of subcultures and uh, the ability for people to link with individuals that are like-minded anywhere in the world, therefore creating in a way a culture uh, everybody to their own sync, to their own uh, preference. When I came to this project, originally I had another project in mind. I wanted to record the Venezuelan voices from the Venezuelan people and uh, see how the gaming industry, people that uh, live playing six or more hours a day in online games such as World of Warcraft. Uh, there are a lot of studies of that in the United States, but there is a uh, little focus of that, uh, as much focus of that in Latin America. And so some things such as gold farming in video games have uh, increased in relevance in the ICT 4D discourse. And I wanted to see if we could do uh, photo ethnography, uh, video ethnography also, where uh, I will provide cameras or help students in Venezuela to record their day-to-day -day events and also follow these gamers online. So help them tell their own story. And my ethnography will be my interactions with them, but also their own personal uh Stories told to their pictures and other data that they decided to share with me. Uh, this project didn't happen, I, and that showed me one of the difficulties in conducting a project at a distance or from a different continent. And uh, what's the motivation and how do you get people involved? And uh, what sort of the connections do you use to have them participate? Uh, what type of incentives do you use? Uh, when I came into this project, I decided then that it would join, if this project uh, would join both the requirement that I have for a uh, class curriculum instruction 5323, which is uh, online learning communities, where we had to see how people develop a sense of community in, um, online, and how online learning uh, was not so impersonal as it seems, that it could actually have a very personal and a more profound aspect sometimes than in the classroom because you're able to share any time during the day and share sometimes that same distance from not being physically present allows you to share things that you wouldn't share in person. So that a different type of community, sometimes even more personal, could develop online. I wanted to see how Wiki Educators use that. Uh, Wayne McIntosh, the founder of Wiki Educator, he believes that Wiki Educator combines those two aspects. That capabilities of technology of spreading information but also having a social network where people uh, can teach each other and help each other to develop in a learning online community. So that sense is really worked well with my other class that I'm, uh, I'm a part of. Uh, and this class was an ethnography and myself having that interest in online technologies I saw that it was uh, the perfect actual project, even more, even, even a better project that I had originally intended with a uh, gaming environment and uh, online gaming in developing countries. I think that project also has a future and I hope to perhaps explore it uh, some other time. But for now, I'm just, I'm just glad I'm able to uh, explore this project. Uh, I am interested personally in increasing access to education internationally. I think there's still today a great degree of social reproduction. And while maybe there is an end an to poverty such as access, in the future, not too far away. Uh, 
still a lot of individuals that have potential excluded from higher education and other and even secondary education, sometimes even primary education, because of the inability of the governments to provide for the resources that they need, including the human capital. Open education resources allows for uh, high quality education content to have its broadest, its widest reach. And in that sense, we can move forward quicker together. And uh, I feel that myself, I've been privileged through my own circumstances. My mom was a university professor, so now I'm in a PhD program. I want to work to break that cycle so that people that uh, didn't have privilege when they were born are able to uh, move beyond their social class and beyond their uh, educational background to uh, find out and to an inquisitive nature find out whatever they want to find out and break that north-south divide and that digital divide and uh, part of that also links to as a development scholar I am interested in um, what is development and any country you could argue is developing at the moment but how are the means of production what does it really boil down to uh, to ISI Latin America tried to industrialize by buying machinery from uh, capital intensive machinery from the West. Now when the machine broke down they didn't have the means to repair, they had to contact a technician or somebody else that had the intellectual capital, the knowledge capital in the Western countries to then repair the machine. And then you also always depended on buying the newest machine from a developed nation. So if you were not buying the primary, uh, the, the basic industries, uh, you purchase the machinery for those industries, you're still relying on the creativity and intellectual productivity of a developed nation. And uh, OER is maybe a way to where we can spread that creative uh, access and uh, that collective, the public domain knowledge through the broadest reach. And uh, in that sense, we can help uh, third world countries develop at a faster rate. Uh, and another interest that I have linked to that is technology can allow not just for information to be duplicated and copied and passed uh, from person to person at a faster rate and a quicker rate and almost uh, instantaneous rate sometimes, uh, depending on your wireless or, or internet connection. But also it could allow for anybody to take a video camera in the future. Cell phones are becoming increasingly ubiquitous. Some countries like the Dominican Republic have 112 cell phones per uh, 100 people. Now, a lot of people have two or three cell phones, but the digital divide in that sense is shrinking. And uh, we have the opportunity to increase uh, access for marginalized voices to be heard within the academy by expressing them themselves or needs. Um, but again, while I come with these biases to this project, I wanted also to um, express that I uh, am a very pragmatic individual and I think like Ben Xiaoping would argue, uh, doesn't matter what color a cat is, as long as it catches mice. In that sense, OER is a tool that may or may not succeed, may or may not help uh, spread education, and to different degrees. And the goals are various, many types of goals. What is important is not sometimes the means or uh, what type of education resources we use to get there, whether private or public, but that it actually has the outcome that we want. In this sense, a decrease in poverty and meeting the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, in that sense, I'm very pragmatic about whether OER function or not. And uh, this uh, study tried to just uh, listen to the OER uh, community members and learn from them to then develop further, uh, more intricate questions for future uh, parts of the study. For a, for a continuation of the study, the study is uh, intended to last much longer than it has currently been much longer than this semester. I became first involved uh, in this project by attending the OERU planning meeting. They had a meeting February 23rd where they uh, met in New Zealand, uh, various universities of the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, to develop a framework where an open education resource university could help reduce the cost to students, but then again, be sustainable. You have, uh, how do we make these good intentions actually 
um, develop this rate of potential. And right now, they're focusing on reaching a critical mass. So by taking part in those meetings a uh, whole day long online uh, to uh, use them uh, live broadcast, I was able to uh, become first involved within the Wiki Educator and Open Education Resource Community. Uh, again, part of this, um, part of my interest is how can the cloud and the tower continue to interrelate. Before we needed libraries to be filled with books and we needed to go to those libraries and we needed to have research done in a place where we could access resources. But now the resources can be anywhere and that's the potential that technology is increasingly given to uh, improving the access to resources and therefore uh, helping develop human capital at a greater rate than ever before. And uh, then the last uh, aspect, one of the last aspects of why am I interested in this subject is uh, where everybody's developing and towards what future is the question. Are we facing, are we following a shadow of another developed country looking at their PISA scores or uh, looking at their um, international, any, any other international testing score or are we leaping into our own future and what future do we want to leap into? And in that sense, uh, technology uh, and the right use of technology in particular can help us leap into the best possible future. Uh, Wiki Educators is uh, how the web page looks. uses the wiki format, same as uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia, in that same cat's book, for example, he argues uh, that Wikipedia in, in 10 years has uh, almost displaced Britannica as the first most commonly cited encyclopedia. And, and, and so an institution that sometimes has 200 years may, to uh, uh, disruptive innovation, be displaced in a very short amount of time. And uh, it was done primarily to the wiki format and everybody being able to contribute. Wiki educators in the same way now is trying to develop educational resources. So it's, it's focused on the institution and the, the credential aspect and that uh, individuals going to formal education. Wikipedia is an education resource, but it's an informal education resource. It's used to supplement you. People are starting to cite so, uh, Wikipedia as a source, but it's still most or primarily an informal education resource. Wiki Educators uses the same technology, but trying to develop quality education resources. So uh, he was founded again by Wayne McIntosh. He first opened in uh, August 2006. And uh, its slogan is to turn the digital divide into digital dividends using free content and open networks. If you look at their uh, diagram of what Wiki Educator is, at the top of it is capacity, content, and connections are the three sides, and at the top of it is the word community. And that again links to my other class uh, of understanding learning communities. And a community is also something that can be studied ethnographically. A uh, community has that, that links between its members that it's more, it's more just than everybody visits the same books, but they have an interaction, a connectivity, a uh, constructivist aspect of uh, cumulative knowledge and uh, sharing uh, between them. Uh, Wayne McIntosh, he uh, argues that as other technologies have been cited by scholars to have revolutionized education and society, such as the blackboard in 1841, the motion picture in 1940, the television in 1957, the computers in 1967, uh, now the internet in particular uh, has the capability to be even more disruptive than those technologies were before because of its social and interactive aspects. Um, and uh, we, why do we need open education resources? Because in many places of the world, uh, we do not have enough money to, uh, to, and we cannot provide uh, secondary or higher education, and a lot of times we like the human capital to do so, and uh, we need to do all we can to uh, you know, disenfranchise some individuals, not provide them that um, equal opportunity by having, they having a, not, we're not going towards an equal outcome, but we have to have the same uh, opportunity based on uh, the resources at the schools, everybody having access to school, everybody having access to, uh, if they work hard through the meritocratic system, uh, be able to go to higher education later on. Technology and social links. Um, again, Unlike other technologies, one of the greatest advantages 
that we have through wiki educators on the internet is that we can link both the uh, possibility for knowledge to duplicate, triplicate, and uh, multiply infinitely. Uh, infinitely even more than we have with the printing press because we were limited by paper. Now we're limited by uh, bits and bytes. And you, when you borrow, when you copy a document, an online PDF, the original PDF remains the same. Uh, in that sense, we don't have a tragedy of commons. Uh, we are able to actually duplicate things uh, almost instantaneously. Um, and also, Wiki Educator allows for the social connection between teachers to develop. It's framed to be a, an environment where teachers can collaborate in developing open educational resources. And their mission is by 2015 to have a free curriculum for all users. And that is uh, helping uh, to develop, working collaboratively with educators around the world. Uh, we aim to develop free content resources in support of all national curricula. And again, we're not replacing closed content, but uh, rather in, uh, noticing that there's both a need for closed and open content. But if you are comfortable with sharing your knowledge, and if you're comfortable with contributing to that, uh, democratic aspect of education. Everybody should have access to it and these resources should not be guarded from a group of people. And if you have that feeling, then you should see if there's possible for you to develop open education resources and share that knowledge that you do not consider to be a guarded uh, secret of a corporation. And uh, I think there's room for all of us uh, to consider part of what our knowledge to be okay to be released into the public domain. Now, we may have uh, reservations about what types of knowledge we consider to be uh, okay to be shared publicly, and that's fine, but uh, it's important to also think about a collective uh, human experience. Again, the year of resources, the year of knowledge is infinitely scalable and will not suffer the tragedy of commons. And uh, I think this picture shows some of the problems we had before. Uh, what's the future of this site? This is a, a this site right now is primarily supported by the Hewitt uh, Packard Foundation, and uh, the governments themselves uh, have not provided as much of a support as could be provided. Uh, the U.S. government was thinking of uh, placing within its grants a cost that requires all the findings to be uh, shared on the Creative Commons CCBY, so basically you just got to attribute, and you can remix or reuse. I would produce any of these documents. Uh, until a document really, until the government truly really becomes uh, financially involved and supports this uh, development of resources, it's likely that the growth of them will be uh, uh, marginal or uh, moderate, uh, but not really uh, exponential or rapid growth. Uh, Wiki Educators has experienced uh, exponential growth in its membership, but again, it was a very small initiative, it's just starting, it's interesting to see where it will plateau, or if it will plateau, or if it will actually, as we would like it to be, become a social movement. So some initiative that uh, Wiki Educators has uh, been invested in, you have the Virtual University for Small States, the Commonwealth Network, uh, that's a network of 30 countries, and they try to have certain uh, shared resources. And, uh, uh, the, the importance of uh, providing a uh, university for uh, the smaller parts of the uh, community um, of the Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, now, UNESCO also, with UNESCO with the Commonwealth of Learning, has developed a computer navigator certificate, and uh, this is a free computer and software training for developing countries. They have also the Plus Four educational initiative that uh, addresses the absence of free content in African schools, uh, the Learning for Content and Scalability program too, uh, which hopes to promote the scale up the development of open education resources. And um, a lot of these uh, initiatives are based in not just spreading these uh, resources, but in creating that, uh, that share alike concept that if you uh, benefit from them that you should probably help develop them and so go from being a learner to eventually becoming a tutor. Uh, it's a pretty common element in the interviews and the experience that I noticed through uh, my 
uh, preliminary ethnographic work. So uh, this is again uh, open education resources. One of the aspects that they allow, and you can see through this picture, is to uh, promote creativity. When we uh, reserve our rights into the materials we create, we also prevent from remixes to be developed. We miss on that crowdsource based innovation. Uh, and uh, that crowd innovation, it's, uh, it's important for us to, uh, to truly meet goals a lot of times quicker. Uh, sometimes we meet a writer's block or, uh, uh, or just, I mean, we, we can't see, uh, an issue from another perspective. Being able to create a product and then allowing somebody else to remix it, uh, it could have like uh, a concern for many financial implications. You could lose your uh, benefits from your creativity, financial benefits. Uh, so if that's a concern, that's the reason why some people don't uh, use CCBY or CC license. But if it's something that really that's not the point for you of developing these resources, then why not? And again, you can create open education resources share them online, and then use advertising as your funding mechanism. Uh, it's not saying that they, you will not have, you, 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 most of the things you create to having these materials on a server takes money and uh, it's uh, necessary for the bandwidth and the, the operation cost of these initiatives to have some sort of funding. And uh, that's one of the main struggles that open education resources are facing. Government support will help maybe uh, Turn that around. So, what are open education resources? They were first created at a UNESCO 2002 meeting. Um, they utilize materials offered freely and openly for educators and self learners to use and reuse for teaching, learning, and research. Now, one of the aspects about it, I, I got in trouble once because I claimed that it was a concept and a professor didn't agree with me. And uh, actually, the literature supports that it is a concept. OECD argues that it includes different aspects about it and they're not so murky and vague. And I noticed that on my interviews. Some people, for example, uh, didn't take into account the first, uh, the digitalized, the digitized work, digitized materials, and they are, well, they're physical and digitized materials. And that's a pretty common, uh, understanding within open edu education resource, or open education resource supporters, that it's not just digital material. Now, the official definition says it's digital material. So, uh, the definition may be broader or narrower depending on whose lens uh, who's uh, developing the definition. In fact, some people say open education resources, others say open educational resources. And I think that's just, uh, it just explains to the, to the murkiness of that uh, subject. Um, again, the brief background on it. This is all part of the free culture movement and also the uh, open source software initiative. Uh, even from the creation of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, he argued that data should be free. And the internet was a way to connect and uh, share information quicker. Uh, but even from its origins, if you uh, look at a TED talk from Tim Berners-Lee today, he'll still argue data should be free. Free data now, because we can, you know, quicker we can move forward as a human group, as a society, quicker we can progress, we can solve the problems faster, we can have this synchronization that sometimes lags, sometimes uh, it would do in line 11, they were saying, well, uh, maybe this would have been prevented if the FBI and the CIA communicated better. A lot of times we have, um, we close our information and that prevents us from communicating properly and meeting our objectives uh, in a more efficient manner. Listening, listening to the field culture movement, he sponsors Creative Commons and um, Creative Commons, uh, again, as I explained, has the number of licenses. And uh, he is uh, for being able to share however you want to share materials. Now, another license is the GNU license, and that's the open source software movement, and that's Richard Stallman. Uh, Richard Stallman's viewpoint is copy left uh, initiative, and GNU is not Linux, which is uh, they call the reverse acronym. Uh, GNU is the G in GNU, is GNU. No, it's not Unix. And, uh, Basically, uh, that license, if you use a uh, GNU license, it requires you that any derivatives you make are also shared under a GNU license. So it's more limited than Creative Commons that could eventually, somebody could take Creative Commons uh, by and then make themselves a Creative Commons by non-derivatives. So you could make it more restrictive. You cannot make a more restrictive license, more open, 
or you can make a more open license more restricted to Creative Commons. You cannot do that through the open source software movement. Um, open source, open access journals is a way that the tower is helping to disseminate and help um, education and uh, high quality educa uh, education content and uh, journal articles to spread uh, internationally. It's interesting to know that, I mean, if you're at the top of uh, Google Scholar, you probably will get cited more than you're at the bottom of Google Scholar. Uh, one way to do that is to increase the copies of your materials. And if your materials are open and are not only accessible to one journal uh, web page or uh, to proprietary access, then you may have a greater chance of being cited. So there's a benefit not just for um, the general society, you could argue, uh, but also um, benefit for um, the writer itself, for the professor, uh, scholar. Now, uh, open education resources, they again were developed by UNESCO, and one of the main promoters is David Wiley, and all of this is within part of what Yokai Banker calls open source economics, and he argues that this is the segment of economics that we got to pay attention to, and it's increasingly going to be important for uh, for the future business ecology or the future uh, environment. Uh, Creative Commons, you can see, uh, like the little guy points out, there's many types of licenses that are Creative Commons. And Lisa wrote this book, uh, Free Culture Book. And uh, again, that's not a free book either. So it's interesting, a lot of uh, the books written by uh, supporters of the free culture movement are not free books. Now, every single, uh, the, the money you pay to, uh, when you buy the free culture book, goes to support creative commons but uh, still it's always uh, important to notice that I mean even if you support education for all and uh, spreading access that you have to find a way to live so uh, many of these scholars and themselves uh, charge money for the resources sometimes um, Ubuntu Ubuntu again means community and uh, it's a very inclusive word and uh, Ubuntu is uh, the name used for one of the most common Linux operating systems. Uh, most servers, three quarters of servers in the world today, and that runs most of the networks are run to Linux. And it's important to uh, see the impact that open source software has had on international uh, networks in uh, general, a broader ICT. Um, because it has succeeded, and a lot of projects such as the Mozilla Firefox projects are sustainable in the sense that they have a large trust fund and uh, they keep improving and high quality uh, materials, high quality software. If you use Firefox, then you are part, you, ha you are supporting the open source software uh, initially. And basically open education resources is open source software moving from being just uh, computer programs uh, where everybody coaches together to uh, education materials where everybody could uh, theoretically make that education material better. Um, MIT and other major universities in the United States have been at the forefront of this charge. Uh, 22 institutions in the United States are part of uh, the Open Courseware Consortium and there are universities all throughout the world that are part of the Open Courseware Consortium and this developed started at MIT and MIT has opened 2,000 of its courses and now it has increased MIT enrollment. So there's also an argument that just because you open lifelong learning materials, you don't necessarily uh, endanger the, the ability for your institution to, uh, to sustain itself or to find uh, people to enroll in its courses. And universities like UMN, very unlikely that UMN, by opening part of its courseware, would have, or even all of its courseware, would lose uh, enrollment and would decrease uh, its revenues. It may decrease its revenues only as much as it costs for UMN to uh, create these courses online. And if we go through the freedoms, it's not just free as in um, the free culture movement argues you have freedom to use, freedom to adapt to your needs, freedom to help your neighbors by making copies and then even broader help your community by having these resources available. Uh, if we remember, uh, as I explained, open education resources are more key uh, concept. That's because there are tools in that, still tools that are part of the concept, uh, such as content management system development, software, uh, such as software, learning management systems, and then there's content. And um, 
developers, and then there's implementation resources. And all that together is the e ecosystem of open educational resources. Mini ethnography. This project, uh, again, started with Dr. Pratt's but I would like it with your support, and uh, perhaps one or uh, somebody in this class will want to be part of this project. I'm, I'm looking right now for uh, seeing who else wants to uh, work in, in this uh, idea, with this idea, and take it further and uh, be able to, uh, uh, again, as part of this project, um, as part of the agriculture movement in general. Uh, I'm not so interested in single author work, but what can we do together? And uh, perhaps some one of you may be interested in uh, transforming this into a nine month to a year project. Uh, for triangulation of this project, I used participant observation. As again, I was in the meetings from the beginning. I made a broad literature review. I'm still reviewing the literature. It's my topic for my dissertation. I hope it uh, to be the topic that I fit to see it as, a, as, a, as an initiative. To be the topic that I invest most of my life with. Uh, I'm using a discourse analysis of forum data, and the forums are open, so they were easy to access. And then I conducted interviews, and this presentation will primarily focus on the interviews. Uh, the literature review, I looked at the literature from the OECD, UNESCO, uh, David Wiley, Stephen Jones, uh, Johnstone, uh, Anna Kamenetz, uh, she did the DUI, DIY, DIY University book. Um, and then you have other people, such as Clayton Christensen, that did the Innovator Dilemma book. Um, and the book in the middle, actually, it's, uh, you can look at the book at the foreword by Wayne McIntosh. So, uh, and that's, again, the person that found it. Um, Wiki Educators, and that book's all about promoting open textbooks. And uh, this is an example. I grab all the works within that, uh, what is open chapter at the, at that book I just mentioned, and I put all those words into this word cloud. But then, had I just made that uh, Creative Commons a uh, non-derivative uh, or or right to serve image, then I cannot remix it. So it's, I mean, this is ugly, but uh, anyhow, uh, this uh, is not possible. This other image without having an open license. So uh, it we can create much more. If we upload our things from the internet and just let them float and see who else picks it up. At least with the things you do, don't think you want to make money on. Um, for my participant observation, again, it started in February. Then I was part of, uh, of a course later on, the Open, uh, open Community Licensing, uh, Open Content Licensing for Educators uh, workshop. That was a four day workshop. I'm a member of Wiki Educators. I also became a member of SCOPE, the BC campus meetings, for our planning for the uh, Open Education Resource uh, University meeting. Uh, I began developing my own Open Education Resources, a member of the OCW online communities and other open textbook communities and other of these open communities. And I'm also a member of the ORU Google groups, and I am a member of the World System Information Society groups, uh, and that's the UNESCO body, and this is a, a UN body. And uh, they deal with uh, open education resources and the open education resource university groups. And they have debates. They were debating whether uh, commercialization of open education resources was fine last week, and the majority of people said that yes, it was. And uh, there were obviously uh, there's a lot of debates within the supporters, uh, even though it's a human genius group. Uh, so again, I attended that meeting, uh, the discourse uh, from the 21st to 25th, 25th of March. And it was four days. The first day uh, was why does open education, open matter in education? What constitutes an open education resource? What can educators legally copy in one on one world? And how can educators define their copyright for sharing knowledge? So it's a brief course, uh, a lot of fun. And again, look at the sponsors the Open Corporate Consortium, Creative Commons, Wiki Educators, and UNESCO, the API office. So um, all these institutions. A lot of times reported also by the Hero Foundation are trying to promote um, the use of this, uh, increased use of, increased openness in education. Uh, I saved some of the tweets here uh, to just to show you that my level of participation. When Mike and Tosh there uh, retweeted one of my comments, knowledge of education is free, but knowledge from different regions of the world should be respected and valued. 
Um, again, it is, uh, and you can see here another person from Venezuela actually taking part on these uh, meetings. Uh, a person from India, a person from Peru, another person from New Zealand. So how uh, these courses, even though the Commonwealth of Learning, is not in all the states. I mean, some of the states are independent and were never British colonies uh, or uh, related to England. Um, that they are part of these courses because it's that, that ability to connect internationally that you have through the internet. So uh, this is a response I gave to one of the forums. Uh, I made a, some suggestions for the next time they did um, this uh, licensing for educators uh, course. I suggest that they needed more examples about uh, the case studies that they had for um, Creative Commons, for the cases of Creative Commons. Uh, I also, I mean, I visited Scope, the Google Groups University, and uh, again, this is, uh, it shows there on the corner, two OER favored commercial use, that was the debate they had, and the other debate they had. Two mobile phones contribute more to social impact than to economic impact in developing countries. This is a UNESCO website, and uh, UNESCO is trying to do that to help uh, spread um, this type of high quality education content uh, worldwide. So, the interviews I took a list of the participants in the ORU planning meeting. I made a Microsoft Access database, we included the name, your description, email, log institutional website, also included the country they're from, and then I uh, uh, tried to send personalized email from Access, but it didn't work that well, so I used Timeline, which uh, I included it links to my Google Calendar, and I provided for 24-7 availability. So most people are in New Zealand. Uh, so it was important to myself to be flexible with my schedule. Um, I sent, here it says, for example, 376 times are available in the next two weeks. And it says that Tom Caswell has not responded to my invitation. And um, it, was, it, it would tell them things such as the interview would last 30 minutes, and I sent 232 in invitations, and only 14 people replied. Uh, a little bit more than that, actually. But uh, and some of those I wasn't able to meet with them because then they had complications with schedule. I had issues with my schedule too, so uh, that also interferes. And just by sharing that link, they uh, they are able to uh, to communicate with me uh, to to sign up for uh, for any. And this is, uh, I sent two emails. The first time it was, uh, more, uh, explaining my bias at this point. And then it was just, if you want to participate in this interview, a little bit shorter of an email. And it actually had more responses. Uh, I also sent the second email to a lot more people. And again, it only shows uh, six, seven times I'm available. And I did that by design, so it doesn't look like I'm available all the time. But, uh, I chose many dates that I'd be available. And they, they were able to, uh, to mark the dates. And this is still ongoing. Uh, for the remainder of the semester. Uh, I changed only one name here of the people I have interviewed so far, and that's because she, uh, because of the reciprocity aspect, I told her I would send all these people a copy of the interview once it's tra transcribed, and then they could make additional remarks and changes and r ratify that that is what they have said and stated. Uh, to respect for, uh, I respect for uh, the privacy of people, uh, that Joan Garfield, that's not really her name, uh, but she, uh, she said some things that she felt that were better to be private, and, uh, until I obtained from her consent to publish her name, then, uh, uh she'll uh, be Joan Garfield. So, so, uh, I used a semi structure, uh, interview, uh, System and this is just these are actually the ones you see here. A lot of questions. These are actually the questions that I asked the most. I asked all the questions too. And uh, one common complaint was ask questions separately because if you can see, I put three questions together. It's a lot of times. And the main complaint was, well, uh, ask three questions and you please uh, break them up. But I, I tended to group questions together so that I have a uh, richer answer. So I wouldn't have actually those small answers that they would think of a broader issue in general. Uh, I, I'm still debating what's the best way to do that. Uh, I guess, and it, I think it went by a case by case basis. Some people they mind the longer the longer questions, uh, interview questions. Some people I think mind it a little bit. Uh, 
The main question is how they became involved with open education resources and uh, how important is administrative support, uh, greatest obstacles, uh, is it is OER a common household term, what well, is a person to become more active, have they met people within weak educators and they met them outside weak educators, how uh, close need, what are the type of bonds in the community, uh, what kind of, uh, how they see the group being, homogeneity of the group, and I changed that question, I want a political identity, I made it about that, more of a uh, how homogeneous the group is. Uh, what other sites they frequently visit? Are they sustainable? What is their ultimate goal? How do they see OERs being five years, two years, ten years from now? What's another common question? Because I'm interested in seeing what the perception of what the end goal is. Um, question development. I wrote them. And my wife edited them. Ellie Lewis, she's a master in Latin American studies and she's going to be a UMA law student. So uh, it's not just my wife, but I think of her a lot intellectually. So I felt that. I mean, I was, I was glad that she looked at him. Uh, then Joanna in class looked at him and helped me select some of the uh, most important questions. And then they were also say, send, sent to my instructor at curriculum instruction, uh, Dr. Cassie Charbert, for uh, suggestions. More about how we design the next iteration, or how we group questions, and uh, what are some better questions to ask. And she's not linked to this research at all, but since she's involved in online, in the communities, I saw that her input would be important moving on forward. Uh, respondents were also asked for feedback, and again, I also send them, I also send them, or, and will send them, the ones I haven't finished the transcripts of the interviews, the ones that I do later, uh, so that they can uh, have that reciprocity element with them, and uh, they will feel more uh, that they be taken into consideration and account in my research. And they were asked for feedback after the interview, right after. And then uh, the questions are going to be reevaluated. At various points through the either because a question has seemed to have been um, answered enough and there's not really a debate uh, or uh, or because uh, some questions are not really getting at what I'm gonna get at but uh, that's that's something I'll, I'm working on uh, right now as I evaluate the current set the first set of interviews uh, what are some hidden questions that I had how open are these communities to research I contacted Wayne three times um, to try to get him to uh, meet with me and uh, I have him in my Skype, he's really busy so hopefully I'll meet with him later. Actually right now I'm postponing meeting with him, Table Green uh, told me, sent him a text message so he would meet with me and he was willing to but then at that point I was like well I think it's better to wait till I have my research better developed. But uh, part of it is it's an open community so it should also be open research. And uh, to what degree that is the case, because there's also institutions that support this uh, this movement, and uh, how they feel towards those institutions, and are they receptive? How are they, how receptive are they to criticism? And uh, what does it take to be an insider? Uh, what do they think open is? And again, what do they think of me as a researcher from the University of Minnesota? Uh, transcribing to uh, prevent problems, to diminish issues. I had three different audio video recordings of each interview. Use a video recorder, use Audacity, and then I use a desktop screen recorder, uh, such as Ubuntu, uh, from Ubuntu and Audacity from Ubuntu. Then I uploaded them to YouTube, uh, the audio, to try to get free transcription, but that didn't work. It was gibberish. I mean, like, it would talk about uh, monkeys on trees and uh, apricots and uh, wild roses. It's made no sense. So, uh, automatic transcription doesn't work yet. So I ended up transcribing word by word and I need a pedal to do this better. Uh, again, this is a screenshot of my, uh, my chat with Cable Green. Uh, you can see there in this screenshot that I am... Uh, if you see at the top, there's a little white square. That white square is screen record. Then on the background is the Audacity. And I'm talking to him to Skype. We're both seeing each other. And on top of that, I... Um, I have a digital recorder on the side of beside my computer recording audio uh, through a non-computer, but a, a different digital device. Uh, another interview with Steve Forrester, and Steve Forrester, uh, uh, his video was shopping there, uh, but uh, anyway, he, uh, he argues that uh, it's important for this initiative to move forward, that as Wayne McIntosh argues that we need to encourage universities to devote the equivalent of one full-time person for the development of open education resource. And that we at least need a sort of institutional commitment. And uh, 
it's a little by little. The more institutions that get involved and the more that they're willing to devote some of their resources to open education resources, the more this project can move forward and scale and perhaps reach a critical mass towards there, actually have a major significant impact within the educational costs and educational experience for students. Um, I had an interview with Abel Kane. He's the head of, uh, he's in charge of uh, the World uh, Society, System Information Society groups for um, for open education resources. And I, I was able to meet with him while he's in Paris and he has some connection problems that day, but uh, it, he really uh, helped me understand better UNESCO's position and UNESCO's experience from having that started with the development of the term um uh, in 2002 to uh, today so uh and now what what stage are they in today so um, i'm glad i was able to talk to them uh, online even though it's in paris and uh, this is one of the things he says he argues that uh we're slowly moving to developing countries the rate of production is extremely slow and this is where going to this competitive advantage and uh and then at the end it says uh UNESCO CI sector is working on a platform that uh, that a lot of software products uh, that were developed by the U.S. institution are not 100% relevant for developing countries. You can take your wiki and transplant it in the middle of Ghana. It will just not work. Uh, Dr. Theo Martin, I also met with her. She uh, is part of the Open Textbook Advocate Trainers. She's also a supporter of wiki educators. Her main concern was uh, was around that was uh, what's the importance of uh, uh, how can open education resources lower the cost of textbooks. So she didn't have such a macro goal, I would say, as others for open education resources. She did say that the group was significantly homogeneous, even though she seemed with my own child with her. She did have. Uh, a different view of open education resources in, in some ways, some aspects to other supporters. So uh, it depends on how micro or macro you are thinking about it. There is some homogeneity within the group from my interviews, but uh, uh, there's also differences in the scope or the end goal that they see open education resources uh, leading to. So her involvement has grown, she argues, and uh, I believe in open education resources because they are far more available to students in digital form where you don't have to buy these books. Advocate and promote these resources through our institute realizing education's potential future. Education's potential institute. Um, and this is again her website. Again, like um, leasing, she charges, she has a book online and she charges $40 for it. So uh, that myth that they are promoting is only three things. That's uh, something that is uh, as Abel Kane would argue, the red herring you know, that this, that this uh, that the project is just uh, promoting freedom, free uh, as in free beer, uh, instead of just freedom of use, and uh, that open education resources are trying to work in that you have the private and the public sector together working towards the improvement of education, not just the public sector. Uh, some other comments from interviews, uh, Sian Liston. He was interested in the fact that he had met Wayne personally in New Zealand before becoming involved. He, that the fact that you have that uh, lending in, or uh, to what degree do people become involved because of the internet connections or people they meet online, and to what degree they become involved with people they meet in person. And Sean Liston is an example of becoming involved by who he met through his social network in New Zealand. And, and a common concern he expressed is that he keeps trying to spend more time developing open education resources but it's hard for them to find time to do so. Uh, Joan Garfield, uh, she argued that she believes that OER's main help will be to, uh, by having OERs, the for-profit industry will lower its costs and improve its services. Joyce McKnight, her concern is, uh, is looking forward to when the United States will have its first open university. And uh, she sees uh, the OER community as homogeneous, uh, similar to Dr. Martin. And uh, Dave Porter. Dave Porter argues that uh, 
OER supporters are a very similar philosophically, but his concern was uh, at the other person, but a uh, uh, Joyce and a uh, Martin. Now, his concern was that there needs to be more of a space for uh, other individuals to speak about open education resources. That there's a certain number of evangelists that primarily speak about open education resources, but that the toy hasn't been passed properly enough, and uh, there's almost charismatic figures within the community instead of uh, uh, being a broader outreach, that the outreach hasn't been sufficient. Uh, Cable Green, he um, he was a very articulate and uh, interesting person to talk to, and uh, he was also very helpful in that he sent messages to uh, various members so that they could meet with me in the future. And I haven't actually been able to meet other people through the connections he made, but uh, and that was my decision. But I hope to uh, do that in the near future. Uh, and then I met Simon Jalams from Jamaica, and uh, he argued the importance that it is for resources to be contextualized, but that he actually his concerns were primarily that there's not enough uh, support, financial support for the development of open education resources, and that uh, not enough is being done in the use of them because. Um, there's yet to be more of an institutional investment in, uh, in their use. So uh, some of the conclusions is that, uh, again, there are different motivations. Some want free books, but other ones free education for everyone. Um, there are different uh, locations. OER has a transnational appeal, and that's primarily the result of uh, some of the possibilities that are, are, are now uh, available for people through uh, modern technology. Um, they are looking for a critical mass or a tipping point, a point where uh, open education will be uh, um, more of a more of a player in the educational ecosystem. And uh, research are primarily being developed in English. Uh, another, um, it was pretty clear that there's a little, most actually, another aspect that more of the research, most of the research are developed by a single author. And then uh, the community seemed uh, open and receptive to the email invite, and I was actually glad that I was able to talk to some of the main players in open education resources. Um, and uh, there are quality and support concerns uh, across the people I interviewed. For my research framework, I need to refine my interviews further. That's one of my conclusions. I need to ask more details. Uh, like what exactly is uh, most important to them, open textbooks or uh, open education? They, they mention it implicitly, but uh, it'd be nicer for me to ask it in a more explicit manner. Uh, the need for additional interviews and uh, um, just having more numbers, more data to, to uh, analyze. And the need uh, for uh, help, and again, uh, somebody else or a component of CID that focuses on open education resources, that would be great. And uh, again, I noticed how difficult it is to immerse yourself within an online community. It's easy to uh, just uh, invest a little bit of time and get away from it. You're not there physically. The internet is the place. And uh, for any, you can be immersed in it, but you're also uh, immersed in the internet as you're immersed in a, in a physical environment at the same time, too. So you can always unplug. And that's the difference between uh, doing ethnography in a physical location. So uh, thank you very much, and I uh, hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation.